Hello, and welcome to part two of How Satan Deceives Mankind. In part one, we saw that Satan's overall purpose was to stand against all that is godly and everything that God desires to do and those whom God loves. Secondly, we saw that he is the enemy of mankind. Because God loves mankind, he has now become mankind's enemy. We saw that he walks about to and fro through this whole earth, seeking whom he may devour. We also saw that God has warned us to be aware of Satan's tactics, lest he should get an advantage over us. And then we also saw that God placed Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. He gave them free reign of all that he had created, gave them everything that they needed. He just put one restriction on them. And that restriction was one tree that is in the garden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They are not to eat from it, and the day that they do eat from it, that they would surely die. So now we pick up there, and Adam and Eve are in the Garden of Eden, and Satan comes in to begin his temptation. So let's look at Genesis 3, verses 1 through 7. These are the verses that we are going to begin to break down. Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Listen to this now. Then the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of the fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he also ate. There's the story. There's the entire picture of what's, going, of what's taking place here. And now Satan begins his attack. So let's look at number one, Satan's target. What is Satan's primary target when he is coming to deceive us? And that target is your mind. Satan is going to go after your mind. Why the mind? Because the mind is where we think. The mind is where we reason things out. It's how we make decisions. We use our mind naturally to think through a process, to reason things good, bad, and different, and we finally make decisions. The mind helps control and regulate our emotions and our will. What is it that we will do and what we won't do, and ultimately what we finally do, our actions themselves. Everything is controlled by our mind, so Satan is going to go after that. He's going to attack that first. Listen to 2 Corinthians 11.3. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3. But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his craftiness, so your minds shall be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ Jesus. Now the context of this verse is they're talking about, as we mentioned last time, how Satan wants to blind our eyes to the gospel. He doesn't want people to see the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The comparison here is, is Satan doesn't want you to see it, but he goes all the way back to Eve. And he says, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his craftiness, so also your mind. See, he worked on Eve's mind and he works on your mind. And he says here that as the serpent beguiled, that's the Greek word apoteo, and that means to deceive. So as the serpent deceived, but in this verse, it's ex apoteo. It's a stronger form of deceive, and it means he thoroughly deceived her. And keep that in mind as we're going through this whole account here of what took place in the Garden of Eden. Satan not only deceived her, he totally deceived her. He thoroughly deceived her. She didn't have any idea what in the world it was going on. She had no idea who she was really talking to. And that's the way Satan likes it. So he attacks our mind. And what is, how does he attack our mind? He uses deception. Here's one of his methods of attack and attacking our mind. He uses deception. Genesis 3.1 Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. The Hebrew word here for cunning means sly or crafty. King James translates it subtle. 
the most subtle beast of the field. Satan disguises himself. He uses deception. When he approached her, he went to the serpent because the serpent was the most subtle beast of the field. He just didn't come barging in and go, hey, Eve, guess what? Here I am, all split foot himself. Have I got a deal for you? Look, here's God over there, and here's me over here. You know, the, the angel here and the angel here. Which one do you want? No, no, no. He come in and he picked a beast that did absolutely nothing to alert her or threaten her. Now again, when you think about the serpent, don't think of some serpent that, you know, is slithering, the snake that's slithering around on the ground today. That is not what the serpent looked like. We don't know what it looked like, but we know it didn't look like that. Because if you read on later in Genesis, when God cursed the serpent for what he had done, he said, now you will crawl on your belly and eat the dust of the ground. So part of that on the ground, like he slithers, was part of the curse. Whatever it looked like, she certainly was not afraid of it. Don't just think of this thing coming up, you know, with the two beady eyes and the tongue wiggling out in your face. No. That, I know if, if that's what he picked to come after me, that would have been a red alert. Because me and snakes, we don't get along. I would have just turned around, done a Jesse Owens, and been out of there. So whatever he picked, she had no fear of it whatsoever. It's like a, a little dove coming down on your shoulder. She had no 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 fear that something is wrong here and that's how satan comes to us he's very subtle he's very cunning he's very crafty he disguises himself he comes and he appears friendly he, he gives the idea that i'm here to help you eve i want to talk to you for a minute I want to help you. I, I, I only want what's best for you. I would never do anything to hurt you. That's all what's implied here. He looks harmless. Again, whatever this beast was, it looked harmless. It was not threatening to her. It's a dove maybe versus a hawk. You know, this little bird comes a little, little over here and lands on your arm. You're not worried about it. Some big hawk comes down with these claws like this. You're ducking for cover. No. He disguises himself. He uses deception. And he does it today. And listen how he does it today. 2 Corinthians 11. 2 Corinthians 11, verses, verse 13 through 15. And he's talking about, God's talking about false prophets here today. False teachers. And he says, For such are false prophets, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. We've got false prophets, we've got deceitful workers who are making themselves look like apostles of Jesus Christ. How can this happen? Look what he says here. And no marvel. Don't marvel over this. Don't be amazed over this and say, how can it happen? For Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Did you get that? Satan, who is evil and deceptive for evil and deceptive purposes, will make himself look good so that he can deceive you and you don't understand what's going on. So he says, no marvel, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. That's a powerful verse there. And we really need to be alert of that. Remember, be sober, be vigilant, pay attention. So apply it to today. He's coming here and being very deceptive. Bring it up until today. What are some examples? One of my pet peeves, televangelists. Um, but not only televangelists, false prophets, pastors that are in the pulpit, they got no business being in the pulpit because they're not preaching the truth of the word of God. The televangelists that are on TV, and remember I've said before in other lessons I've taught, there are some good televangelists on television, so we're not broad brushing here. But by far, I believe more than, than, than isn't, are false prophets, are wolves in sheep's clothing, are Satan appearing as angel of lights. Many of them come and they look harmless. They look like they're there to help you. They appear to be preaching the Word of God. It's a very deceptive thing. If you go to church and you turn on somebody and you stand with a pulpit with the Bible in his hand going, Thus saith the Lord. You're not thinking an attack's coming from there. You're not thinking a deception is coming there. And especially if that pastor or that preacher or that televangelist appears to be doing a lot of good things in God's name. Oh, look at the wonderful works. Look at the big ministry that they have. Oh, look at the people that they feed. Oh, look at the little churches over in Africa that they build. Oh, look at this. Oh, look, oh, look at how many thousands of people are getting saved. You know, you need to really understand what in the world's going on there. I did my doctoral dissertation on televangelism. 
And let me tell you, it was less than 1% of people that, that watched them that were truly Christians themselves, and there were a whole lot less people were getting saved. Now, can people get saved through televangelism? Absolutely. But by no means is it the number that these people are talking about. And by no means were they reaching unsaved people. Like I said, it was less than 1% of their viewers that weren't Christians. 99% of them, 99 point something, were actually Christians watching. So there weren't that many people getting saved through televangelism. But as people sit back and think about these things, they go, oh, look at all the wonderful things that are done. So they must be good. In reality, many of them are wolves in sheep's clothing. They bend, they twist, they mutilate, they distort the word of God. They are deceivers. They're doing the work of Satan. Some of them just flat out lie. Some of them just, there's not even a distortion of Scripture. They're saying the Word of God says this, and it doesn't say anything like it. I've listened to some of them, and the Word is actually saying the opposite. But if you don't have the wisdom and you haven't studied the Scriptures enough yourself, you don't even know it. And most people that sit under these people just sit back and just blindly take it. They just gulp it down because they think it's coming from a good source. More often than not, a person is just seeking their, their own pleasure. They're seeking their own profit. They're getting wealthy through what they are doing. There are those who aren't getting wealthy, but they're twisting and mutilating and distorting the Word of God. And the bottom line disaster is that they are keeping people from knowing the true God. And that's what Satan wants. That's what Satan wants to take place. You think this isn't possible? You think it can't happen? Listen to the Word of God. Matthew 7, verse 21. Matthew 7, verse 21. This is Jesus Christ speaking here. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? We've preached in your name. Haven't we cast out demons in your name? And haven't we done many wonderful works in your name? Look at all that we've done, God, and we've done it in your name. We've named the name of Jesus. We preached and preached your name. We cast out demons, and we did it in your name. We've done not some works, many wonderful works in your name. Listen to what Jesus says to them. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice iniquity. You who practice sin, you who practice lawlessness. That is a devastating verse. You got to sit back and go, are you kidding me? How in the world can that possibly happen? How can things be done in the name of Jesus using his name? That doesn't mean in truth, and it doesn't mean in the power of Jesus. It just means they use their name. Satan appearing as an angel of light. But what they were doing were not, was not really from God himself. And he didn't look at him and say, you know what, you guys were on the right track, but you kind of made a left-hand turn somewhere. No. He says, I never knew you. You were never one of mine. You were never doing my work. They're standing before him at the judgment. And what does he say? Out of here. You've got to be kidding. That's devastating. But that's got to say to us, you know what, we need to know what the Word of God teaches we need to understand truth. We need to be sober. We need to be vigilant because that devil is out there and he's doing everything he can to deceive me. I've got to pay attention. I've got to be alert. In part three, we're going to continue to look on at how Satan deceives us and more of the tactics that he uses. We really want to pay attention to this because he's a wily character. I thank you for watching today and as always, may the Lord bless you.